I'm Chris Richardson, and this is Not A Pipe Podcast. Thank you very much for joining me on the first episode of 2020 for This Is Not A Pipe Podcast. I'm thrilled to be speaking with Susana Vargas Cervantes, whose book, The Little Old Lady Killer, The Sensationalized Crimes of Mexico's First Female Serial Killer, is not only an interesting book for criminologists and people studying crime in various ways, but also for those interested in cultural studies, gender studies, intercultural communication, and a number of other disciplines that may not be readily apparent just from the cover of the book. I really do appreciate receiving this because I could easily have missed it in all of the chaos of the seems like millions of books that come out each year. But after reading it, I really cannot recommend it highly enough. I encourage anyone who wants to start their new year with a nuanced and insightful reading to pick up The Little Old Lady Killer. I have no doubt that you'll be glad you did. Susanna has also been kind enough to generate a list of five recommended readings that she has contributed to the website, which you can find at tinapp.org. Definitely encourage people to check that out as well. Don't hesitate to look for her recommendations along with any of the other guests that we've had over the last three years now. So let's get right into it. Thank you so much, Susanna, for speaking to me today. I've been anticipating this interview after reading your book. It's a really captivating story, but listeners may not be familiar with it. I know I wasn't before I picked up your book, so maybe we can start with the events that led up to the conviction of this woman in Mexico for the murder of multiple elderly women and how you set out to investigate the ways that criminal discourses and media representations captured the story. Yeah, thank you for having me. So this happened in 2006, so really it's not that long ago. I was listening the news in which a serial killer of elderly women had been finally arrested and he was going to be sentenced. The surprise was that she was a woman. And most accounts of serial killing, it's always uh, talking about a middle-aged man, really intelligent, brilliant. And when, for the very first time in Mexico City, they profile a serial killer, they follow police and government officials, follow this international narrative on serial killing. So they were looking for a middle-aged man who was very smart, who left no trace. They couldn't catch him because internationally, it sometimes even takes 20 years to capture a serial killer if you're lucky. They were really going after this profile. Witnesses kept on saying that they saw a woman or either a man very muscular, someone very tall, who had a wig, who wore makeup, who disguised as a nurse to gain the trust of elderly women and go into their house. And just by pure luck, on January 2006, as a renter was coming home, an elderly woman was on the floor. This was Ana Maria Reyes Alfaro, his landlady, and another woman was exiting running. So at, after he seen this scene, he ran after the other woman. Luckily, two police officers were there and chased these women. And then when they saw her, they immediately stated, she is the little old lady killer. Mm -hmm. even though they were looking for a man and then later a transvestite. She had a plastic bag with a stethoscope and the modus operandi of the serial killer was strangling elderly women with a stethoscope. So they find out what made this story as if it was not already very sensationalist, the fact that she was a wrestler. Mm -hmm. So they discover that she was in the world of Lucha Libre a professional wrestler, and she fought as the Lady of Silence. Yeah. This gave media the perfect sensational history, and she was declared then to be the little old lady killer, even though other two people beforehand had been arrested and imprisoned for killing elderly women, one a woman and one a man. And after that, we don't know if there had been other elderly women killed, and there were more than 30 cases that were not attributed to her, to Juana Barraza, that's her name. She only confessed to that one murder for the one she was caught. Yet police and media officers declare that she is officially the serial killer they had been struggling to find for over two years. 
Yeah, and you've already started to mention this in your description now, but your book, of course, is not the sensationalist retelling of this that it could easily be, that it, I'm sure, was in many tabloids. What was your goal in looking at this event from a scholarly perspective for this book you eventually published with uh, New York University Press? Well, at the beginning, it was really to look at the ships that police and media had talked about or had analyzed or were looking for when like how it shifted when they first thought it was a man then when there were witnesses accounts pointing at a woman and that moment police decided that it must be a transvestite they couldn't believe that a woman could kill and so or will have the strength and because they were focusing all the time on international narratives of serial killing they couldn't conceive of a of a female serial killer at that time. They focused the search then on the case that had happened in 1989 in France with the uh, Monstre de Montmartre, where he was a transvestite serial killer or alleged serial killer who killed elderly women and he dressed as a woman. So he had had a very terrible childhood with his mother and he felt a lot of revenge or this is what the official accounts are mm -hmm. towards elderly women. And so the police in France actually came to Mexico, gave the police in Mexico a course over a whole week on how, on how to capture a serial killer when it's a transvestite. This was another international assumption or other assumption that is international about serial killers. And when finally they arrested Juana Barraza, then the whole narrative changed and then it went from thinking that the serial killer was brilliant to a pathological serial killer. So I was interested in these shifts in gender and in class, how they work when they believed it was a man, a transvestite, and when they finally arrested a woman. Why in Mexico? It was for the very first time spoken about this specific kind of violence as a dehumanized society. The chief prosecutor stated in many press conferences and official press releases that for the very first time in Mexico, we were talking about a society that had forgotten the family values, that didn't have moral values, that serial killing was a phenomenon that happened in the United States and in movies, but it didn't happen in Mexico, and that now crime had been globalized. This really called my attention because what we know of Mexico nationally and internationally is the high levels of violence. At that moment, I already have heard in press and in tabloids how there had been in the 80s narcosatanicos, some group of drug dealers that believe in the protection of the devil. And the leader, he will have many governors and drug dealers, police were involved too. They will kill people to take their bones and make necklaces. They did santeria, or this is what the newspapers report. Mm -hmm. And when they were finally going to catch him, he committed suicide. And his partner, Sara Lerete, she's in prison, in the same prison actually as Juana Barraza. Hmm. I never read that this was a dehumanized society. What was most important to me later was also to understand why there had been so many women killed in Ciudad Juarez and in Estado de Mexico. All of them tortured, mutilated, um, horrible sexual violence, and there has never been a search or a task for or even a serious part of the, of the authorities to look for those responsible. So I wanted to know how media talk about the victims when they were elderly women and why they counted as victims, how media and government officials talk about the victims of feminicides and why they had not been taken seriously as victims. I wanted to know so many things about this case, but to understand more how ideologies of Mexicanidad of who constitutes an ideal Mexican determines in turn who is a criminal and then who is a victim.
I have to say for anyone who hasn't picked this up yet, it's just such a great work of, of cultural studies or cultural criminology. It definitely has elements of critical discourse analysis that may not be apparent, I think, if you if you were just to skim through on a bookshelf. It seems like maybe this is a biography of somebody who did some really horrible things, in which case academically you might not be interested, but it very much is a really important work of cultural studies. How did you first start to think about doing academic work on this? I mean, did you first set out to find out about the case or did you first set out to find out about the media discourses about sort of nationality and femininity and, and these other things that you bring up later? Or what was the sort of starting point for when you started to think about gathering and collecting evidence and research and then starting to form arguments? Was there any particular way in which you did that? Yes, I'm going to say that since the beginning, I was not interested in the culpability of Barraza. Mm -hmm. I really didn't really care when I started it, if she was guilty or not. I wanted to be more focused on how the figure of a female wrestler serial killer, what did it say about constructions of Mexicanidad? Because she was a serial killer, but she was also a professional lucha libre wrestler, I found that there were many similarities in how popular culture and official discourses, I mean, the government and press talked about criminality, specifically serial killers. I, at the beginning, I just noticed how, for example, lucha libre wrestlers, they need a mask. Without a mask, they well, not all of them. They are rude and technicals. Two different bands. Mm -hmm. One is a good one and bad, and one is an, uh, a bad one. The bad one is the one who fights without a proper technique and doesn't play by the rules. And the good ones are those that you know. Also, in a lot of films about lucha libre, you have, for example, El Santo that had a mask that was silver. He, you know, fought against aliens, against vampires. Again, he was like a, a sort of a savior. Mm -hmm. In popular culture, many famous good lucha libre wrestlers have a mask, and they need a mask to exist. When you go to um, lucha libre wrestling on Sunday in Mexico, you have many times uh, when they fight mask against hair. I don't know how to translate it, but basically whoever loses either has to take off their mask or get their hair cut out. Hmm. So mask is a very important feature for wrestlers. Mm -hmm. And they don't exist, many of them, without a, without a mask, like El Santo. And I found that there was very similar narratives for serial killers. They need a sanity mask in order to exist. You know, they like Ted Bundy. He was mm -hmm. like very charismatic, very nice. And he can commit all these horrific crimes, but he had a sanity mask with which he can live a everyday life and no one suspected of him. Mm -hmm. So I started noticing like this one, many similarities in the way that popular culture on one hand uh, ideologies of Mexicanidad in the other one, and criminality in Mexico intersected to define masculinity and femininity, like who was a good woman, an ideal Mexican woman look like. What did she do and how does she speak and what did she say? And then in turn, which one is a bad woman? So who is a criminal? That at the beginning of the science of criminology, it was the poor indigenous women in Mexico. So uh, that was the first layer, mm -hmm. really looking at how this figure of the serial killer and wrestler circulated in popular culture and in discourses of criminality. When I started looking at like going more in depth with this research and then writing the whole book, by the conclusion, I talk about how even though I set out to look at how this figure of, well, of La Dama del Silencio circulated, I, I actually argued that it was La Dama del Silencio, the Lucha Libre persona mm -hmm. of Juana Barraza, who is being criminalized, not the women, Juana Barraza. At that level of the research, I, I say how Juana Barraza, the woman, is not being made responsible for the crime that she committed, but that she has been criminalized for her muscular aspect, for being a wrestler, for being poor, for not knowing how to read and write. Now she knows. She learned in prison. 
but she didn't know when they captured her. So I, I see that there are severe implications with the narratives of serial killing that played out in a specific case in Mexico. But at, by the end, I even though I said that I didn't care about of her being guilty or not, and after having met her, I realized that there was an aspect in which I did want to defend her. I wanted more to defend her right to a certain extent be made responsible for her crimes as opposed to being criminalized for what she is. That is I wanted really more justice in terms of she has the longest sentence for any murderer in Mexico City, 759 years. Mm -hmm. These long sentences speaks to then her be construct, constructed as the worst of criminals. In turn, that makes only the elderly women the only victims that have counted for the nation, for the government officials, that all the victims of feminicides don't count as victims. And no one has been made responsible for so many of the crimes that continuously happen to young Mexican women. Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, there's so many things that this particular case can help highlight in a more general level. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the difference between your approach as a critical scholar looking at this case and looking at the evidence in a sense, and the more quote unquote scientific or objective observers, because you talk about certain scientists that came in and certain police officials that came in and gave their expert testimony. And as you sort of deconstruct in your analysis, they use terms and they use ideas that seem to place them as all knowing, or at least very objective and, I guess, unbiased sources of knowledge, which you, I think, do a great job of questioning. What's the difference, though? How would you describe the difference between how you're taking this case and looking at it and the, the kind of thinking and questions that you have versus these more sort of traditional experts that have come in and talked about her and, uh, and what she has done? Yes, there is a specific book called El Nudo del Silencio, so the knot of silence mm -hmm. following the lead of a serial killer. And it's a bad translation I'm making. I'm not a very good translator, even though I work in both English and Spanish. Translating is a whole other skill. But mm. he's referencing in the title, the knot of silence, that could be um, a wrestling lock, mm -hmm. what wrestlers do in, during a match. He actually, by looking exactly at his book and the book of a uh, main neurophysiologist, the director of, um, of a laboratory in the National Public Autonomous University of Mexico, who determined Barraza's culpability, who, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, are scientifics, but that, as I argue in the book, are criminalizing more La Dama del Silencio, the wrestler, than Juana Barraza. So let me give you some of the examples. In this book, El Nudo del Silencio, the main criminologist is at the same time a police officer, and his name is Martin Barón. And he, in one of the chapters, for example, talks about how both the director of this laboratory and him, both of them, talk about Juana Barraza as a species of person. You know, she stopped being um, she stopped being a, a human that can commit a murder and should be made responsible for that. And they talk about a species of person. You know that very known, famous essay of uh, Foucault, where he talks about the dangerous individual. That there is this moment of zero degree of insanity that something will turn on and immediately will, um, you know that essay? Mm -hmm. Well, so they, they, exactly like that, they talk about Juana Barraza. Uh, Fregi Ostrowski is the director of, or ex-director now, I think. She even recounts on her book how she, she talks about how Juana Barraza must have seen herself in the mirror that day that she killed Ana Maria Reyes Alfaro. And she looked at herself in the mirror and she saw the beast that was inside her. And then when she went and talked to Ana Maria, and, she, and Ana Maria Reyes told her something like, I'm not going to pay you because she was apparently asking for services as a domestic worker to clean or to cook. Ana Maria, the elderly woman, said something despective 
to Barraza. And then at that moment, Barraza felt so much anger that could not be contained that she strangled her. Mm -hmm. So how Fre Fregios Trotsky talks about this is by saying how then when she narrates her on her book, she talks about how then the beast came out and then the beast killed uh, the elderly women. And then she, you know, had all this insanity and all this need to kill that came out of her. And that need was satiated. And then she could rest for a time until she had to kill again. But she talks about it in, in, in these terms of a beast that possessed Juana Barraza. Then when Barra, Juana Barraza is arrested, she performs a series of ESGs, um, on her. And mm -hmm. one that called my attention was that she also talks about it in his book, Fregi Ostrowski, is how she shows, so you, there the photographs are in, in my book too, of how Juana Barraza has a lot of detectors of her brain waves movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's set up with a uh, sort of helmet that monitors her uh, EEG. Yes, that's it. Yeah. So, um, what Fregi Ostrowski explains to you is that she's showing Juana Barraza many different images, an image of a chair and an image of an elderly woman, and then she registers the changes in her cerebral waves. Then she realizes that there is not many, that there's not a big difference in the emotions and the responses that Juana Barraza has. After, with like very scientific language, you know, talking about making references to, of course, other very specific studies, determines that Juana Barraza doesn't feel empathy. She doesn't feel remorse and that she was able to kill. Uh, Mark Seltzer has a very good way of talking about how many scientists talk of the results of their interviews with serial killers and it seems like they are more into shamanism and pseudo-scientific explanations serve more to justify mm -hmm. um, racist and classist beliefs. They're of course focusing on a, a lot of positive criminology but at the end just to answer more concretely your question, my problem is that they are interpreting, and with that interpretation, they are determining the culpability of Juana Barraza. And I am not a scientist, and I, as I mentioned in the book, don't understand exactly well how the, how the results of the wave movements mm -hmm. in Juana Barraza's ECG results let us know that she is someone that doesn't feel empathy and then she can kill. But what I am doing is that I am not claiming objectivity in any of what I am analyzing. I'm giving a, a serious and research point of view, but I am not saying that I am saying that I'm giving an interpretation and my issue with these specific two scientists is that they are claiming objectivity in their interviews and analysis and exams with Barraza through using scientific language, where at the end of the day, they are doing too is an interpretation. Mm -hmm. To come back to Martin Barón, he, for example, to determine if Barraza is a psychopath or not, he follows a Canadian criminal psychology researcher, Robert Hare, who also happened to be an FBI advisor on psychopathology. So uh, Robert Hare had developed a psychopathy checklist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's 11 total points on his scale. But even since the title, how Martin Barron puts it on his book, his chapter is called The Lady of Silence and Harris Scale. Again, he's not looking at Juana Barraza, but as, at the wrestler. Mm -hmm. So in his attempt to establish the links between this um, checklist and his own results of his uh, psychological test, for example, in one of the points, he deduces that psychopaths had a need for excitement. Mm -hmm. Martin Barron deduced from his interview with Barraza that, that, that this specific point was fulfilled because when Barraza was 35, she suffered a very severe injury on her back and she could not wrestle anymore. And because she could not wrestle anymore, she could not satisfy uh, her need for excitement. So then she started killing I'm not saying this is not true or this is true, but I am saying that 
he is interpreting this. Mm -hmm. But he uses, again, this scientific language to determine her culpability. You know, like for him, even the fact that she lacked preparation because she was not a technical, she a technical uh, lucha libre wrestler. She was... She learned from what she practiced of what she has simulated in, in TV that she then is not even a real uh, Lucha Libre wrestler and she couldn't satisfy this need to kill. He also, for example, looks at another point of Robert Hare in which he says uh, psychopaths have a very intense and harsh look. Martin Barron testifies to this because he says that when he met Juana Barraza, she indeed had a very cold, harsh, intense stare. This is another point in which really is not difficult to see how this is an interpretation of a way one looks. And I am sure that when someone is performing a horrible act of violence, must have a very intense look. But there are many people that are not performing a um, horrible act of violence and they again, might have a very intense look. Like, how do we measure intensity? Yeah. And, and it's an interpretation. But he presents it as a total truth and uses it as evidence that Juana Barraza is indeed a serial killer. I, yeah, I mean, reading that, I just found it again on, on page uh, 119, but Harris' psychopathology checklist revised is, it's an amazing concept to me because, yeah, having an intense look, I mean, I've definitely been told at certain moments in my life, especially that I've had an intense look or I looked really serious or, or what have you. I mean, the need for excitement, I mean, who doesn't identify to some extent with like the need for excitement or the desire to be excited and have some excitement in their life, like it is incredibly subjective and yet presented in a codified language that seems also very scientific and very uh, difficult to question until you do something like you're, like you're doing here. Yeah, exactly. I want to add something to that that I just remember because sure. they go back in history citing the very first criminologist in Mexico, for example, Martin Vergara. And these um, scientificos, like the ones in the rest of the world, when criminology as a science was started, they measured the brains and mm -hmm. they did have this interview with inmates. The problem in Mexico is that this has not been problematized. So even though there had been all these critiques to Lombroso, for example, in Mexico, yeah. they have, you know, and you read it since these accounts from 1901, there is this book, Los Criminales in Mexico, The Criminals in Mexico, from one of the main criminologists, Carlos Rumanac, where he also followed this methodology of going to interview prisons inmates in, you know, the main prisons. And then they ask them all these questions about their family, their level of education. But one question that really, because I went back to read all these books from 1901, and when I was reading both Martinez, uh, the book of Martinez y Vergara and the book of Carlos Romana, they both talked about how when they talked to inmates, they asked them if they believe in God and if they felt remorse. Mm -hmm. And then they wrote in their notes, he says that he feels remorse, but actually I don't believe that he feels remorse because so, so, so. Mm -hmm. And so they, that, that is part of their scientific methodology to determine what is the difference between a rapist, a thief, a murderer, and they follow eugenics, of course. And then what is problematic specifically, too, about Mexico is that the people that were in prison, we're talking about post-independence in Mexico. So after 1810, when the independence of Spain had happened and there was a new idea of Mexico and who was going to be the ideal Mexico to occupy this territory, who at the same time was going to be an ideal citizen. And eugenics served to justify very classist and racist beliefs of who should be an ideal Mexican. So it was not a mestizo and it was not a poor and it was not a woman, but it was an, an, an indigenous, very poor people. Like the ideal Mexican was a criollo and a Spanish descendant that looked more European and was more white. Mm -hmm. And the people that were in prison were 
there not only for what they had allegedly commit the crime, you know, a, a robbery or a murder, but also because of their skin and their gender, their skin color and their gender and their class. And when Martin Barron writes his book in 2006, he actually writes that Carlos Rumanac, a hundred years before, was not far, that far away from the truth. Hmm. in terms of who a criminal was. And Frege Ostrowski both asked Barraza if she felt remorse. And then when she said that she did feel remorse, Frege says, I don't believe her because she doesn't know what remorse is. Again, they are totally interpreting and they are not problematizing criminology from a hundred years before, but on the contrary, are accepting themselves of that pseudo-scientific knowledge to criminalize someone in 2008. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I've I've struggled to think about so much in, in my research and my, my readings of crime and media in particular, just because if you go to any critical cultural studies conference, uh, especially uh, the certain cultural or critical sides of the major conferences, like we were talking about earlier, um, the American Society of Criminologists, everyone kind of agrees with what you've just said, I think, which is that there's a, a deeply flawed level of interpretation going on. I mean, when you say that you can effectively see in the eyes of a psychopath their true intention, it is very uh, shamanistic. It doesn't sound scientific in any way. And yet when these same authors present their work in front of, say, a jury, and the jury maybe doesn't have the same kind of critical thinking background from such scholarship or such uh, or reading monographs like your own, I think is very tempting to say like, you know, well, this person clearly knows what they're talking about. She's scientifically a psychopath. She like somehow objectively knows that she looked into a mirror and saw a beast. And I mean, it's so problematic that Obviously, we're not going to solve it today, but I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about where you think research like your own can contribute, because it seems to me that you and I can talk about this and agree on um, probably a lot of the fundamental points. But then if you go to somebody who's testifying as, an, as a scientific expert in a criminal trial, or if you go to a juror who's just listened to that expert, they might come from very, very different worlds, and they're probably not reading the same kind of material. So I'm curious in your mind, in working on this book and in doing the kind of research you're doing, where are you hoping that goes and how are you hoping to contribute to, I guess, improving this kind of conversation or this kind of acknowledgement that, yes, phrenology and eugenics, which continue in more subtle ways today with uh, with algorithms and computer programming and the, um, the visualizing of, of faces that you talk about in this book, what can we do? You know, that is a, a question, too, that I have a lot. I'm going to share with you a, a funny anecdote about this, because there is a software mm -hmm. called the Face of the Mexican that it's used all throughout Mexico to determine a sketch, to make a, a you know, like a, a sketch of a potential criminal. Yeah, it basically so, could appear in a wanted poster or something. Exactly those. Yeah. So... They do it now com computerized all over. And there in Mexico, it was uh, made in 1998 by both a um, physical anthropologist and someone from the, uh, the police and a computer engineer. So they took all this time. And what they did is that they wanted to find out all the possible variables of what a Mexican can look like. Mm -hmm. So they basically a similar methodology, like scientific methodology than the anthropologists that studied crimes with prisoners. They talked to many different Mexicans and they asked them where they were from and if their parents were there from them and grandparents were for, from them too. So that determined that they were from that specific area in Mexico. So after they determined that that person was from, say, Mexico City, because their parents and grandparents were also from Mexico City, then that person became um, someone that they could use in their study and they would take him photos, very young like, with that same scale and mm -hmm. profile and front. And then from that, they went to all over Mexico to have all the potential variables of Mexicans. And then they, ha they came up with, they had something more than 2,000 photographs. 
And then, then they came up with an archive of 500. So among those, you have a set, set of eyes, set of ears, of noses, of mouths, and then you can combine them, and then you have your sketch. And this is the program used currently. And I you know, felt like I could not believe that that was true. Oh, because mm-hmm. especially the, when it came out, the chief officer at the time of Mexico City said, you know, this innovative computerized system is going to save us so much time and it's going to actually be better because we don't have the bias of the artist that does the sketch. And it's, again, more objective and it saves us time. And most of the peop- um, of the database component are 97% men, mestizos or indigenous And I just could not believe this. So then I went and I talked to the anthropologist, the physical anthropologist that did this program. And when I was talking to him, it was like exactly like you say, talking to someone that is not from, you know, doesn't read the same things. And then when I was reading how he came up with this program, I I was having a very hard time understanding. So I went and I talked to him. And when he was talking to me, I was I had a very hard time understanding him what he was saying, like, how could he say these things? And so I would begin even asking him, like, do you think criminality is innate? And he said, no, I don't think it is innate, but I I think it comes from the environment. I'm like, so Ben, then why would you then have this? What is your, like, I kept on going to the most basic of questions to see if we understood each other. And he said that one of the main issues I, I faced with him, not only speaking such different languages because of the materials we have access to and our beliefs, it is that he thought that he explained to me mestizaje because I was saying, how would this be a Mexican? Like, how would this give us a face of a Mexican? Because it has all the variables, but these variables are considering mestizaje to be a biological standpoint from the 16th century in which there was indigenous people, the Spanish came and, you know, that this has been also very challenged, this idea, and, mm-hmm. and not to take it from a biological standpoint, but he, he took it from there. He, he didn't believe criminality was innate and I really didn't know how to talk to him. And I was, what is your objective? Do you believe in punitive systems? But, and then I realized well, first of all, I just then started thinking, am I hangover? Am I like, why can I not understand him? And then this is the anecdote, actually, like from, from this interview on, I didn't have one drop of alcohol during the whole time I wrote the book, because I was like, I need not to be ever hangover, not to, not to lose any clarity, because I want to speak to as much people as possible, because I do hope that we can understand each other, you know, like that I can uh, build a bridge with someone like him. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like as, as, as clear as I think I am, I don't understand. Yeah. And, and I realized with him that he, we, we share the same, the same hope that there is less criminality and that someone that is responsible for a crime. I, I feel now that it's an opportunity to be made responsible of your crime in, because then you feel, you know, when you do a mistake, when you make a mistake, you mm. want to take responsibility as opposed to always feeling guilty about it. And then, you know, of course, murder is horrible, but I don't believe in a punitive. I don't believe in that. So I, I, when I was talking to him, I realized that we wanted the same things. Like very basically, like I had to bring the conversation to base, like what you know, like what who do you think a criminal is then, and all these questions. And at the end, we wanted the same thing: everyone to have a peaceful, free of violent life. Mm-hmm. I was like, how can I, how can I contribute, and how can I build a bridge with someone like him? And I thought that my contribution or my way is through wanting or hoping that. With this book, I can point out to how how we think also determines someone's culpability. That it is in ideologies of how do we think a Mexican should look like and should behave, and the gender and the class and the sex that this and you know and even the religion that this person has who determines more if this person is a criminal than actual evidence because all the evidence presented 
against Juana Barraza is not enough, in my opinion, to justify 760 years. And again, it is not just to defend Barraza, but to see, but to ask what is happening then with those responsible for the killing of more than 400 women in Ciudad Juárez and more than 600 women in Estado de México. Yeah. I mean, one thing I just want to point out to anyone who hasn't read the book yet I, that I thought was just amazing is that doing these sketches, these computerized sketches, putting them out there uh, with the police, she was ultimately apprehended after being seen by a civilian, I, I believe, and then somebody, and then that person yelled out for police. Police chased her, as you point out in the book. The police chasing her had no idea who she was, what she was accused of, and had not seen her face until she was apprehended. And so even the idea that this is a you know scientific innovation that's going to help lead to all of this, it really had nothing to do with, with that capture, even though later it was touted as a, a wonderful technological innovation that, that helped law enforcement. I mean, that, of course, we could argue or, or think about in a, a lot of different ways. You mentioned, though, an alternative to thinking about it in terms of these positivist scientific interventions is thinking about ideology and mythology and even the ways in which religion or, or other cultural values and cultural systems are implemented in day-to-day -day living that can be used effectively to judge guilt and criminality, but are not often used in courts, for example. So you, you might not say in court, we believe in a sort of history of Mexico that has these figures as our uh, sort of leaders or cultural aspirations, and she is counter to that. But I think that does play a huge role in exactly, as you said, why this woman has been the center of a lot of media focus, and her crimes have been at the center of a lot of media focus, the ones that she's been found guilty of. So we can say that now, although we can also say that that's questionable. But anyway, that whole idea of religious practice, of mythology, of ideology, doesn't come out in the scientific discourses. How do you help explain that? I mean, for example, maybe we could start with the altar that was found in her, uh, I, I believe it was her, in her apartment, but and what mythologies and what uh, ideologies were present that helped, I guess, vilify her to the point where she could get almost eight centuries of, of punishment, I guess? Well, I'm going to start with the declaration of one of the main government officials in Mexico who determined that okay. there was a serial killer on the loose came to this conclusion. When he said, as I was telling you, that there is, a, this is also where I started the research asking this question, why is it that he's talking now about a dehumanized society or a society with no values now when they are killing elderly women? And he, then there have not been comparable declarations from government officials when they have killed women in Ciudad Juarez or in Estado de Mexico, or even the very known internationally case of the, 40, uh, of the um, students disappeared, mm -hmm. you know, from Ayotzinapa. None of the government officials have ever made such a declaration about Mexican society. So he went to say this didn't happen to us before. So there was an us that in Mexico that happened before the serial killer and one after. So a serial killer is worse than a narco satanico, is worse than someone who kills a woman, is worse than someone from a cartel, you know, from Los Zetas, for example, mm -hmm. who were already operated in Mexico and they are known for their torturing their victims. Mm -hmm. They, no government official has ever made a declaration of, of how horrible Mexican society is, ever. This is the case that made it. So I was like, oh, why? Why is a serial killer worse than a narco satanico or, or a drug cartel? And the conclusion I came to is that the victims were determined to be victims because of not their age, not because they were more than 60 years old, but because they live alone. A nuclear family in Mexico includes the grandmother, its parents, children, and the grandmother. So he said that these women, elderly women who live alone, they were abandoned by society because their family abandoned them. So what made them vulnerable was not their age, that they were fragile against this monster, you know, this corpulent uh, lucha libre wrestler. What made mm -hmm. them vulnerable was that they live alone. And what determined the modus operandi of a serial killer was that 
he gained the trust of elderly women and they didn't have any option but to let them in because they what they trusted so much you know like elderly women are mothers and they need to mother so much that they will open the door to anyone that knock on, on their door mm-hmm. so them so then they, that the way that they prevent the killings were by saying elderly women don't trust anyone don't open your door that was a, the prevention method they didn't think that an elderly woman will choose to live alone if, like why would she choose to live alone it is the fault of the society that abandoned her. And then it is, it is our responsibility. And then we have a dehumanized society. And that's what the search, the search started. If you look at then who is a grandmother in Mexico, you come to, I'm sure you've seen it, the Nestle chocolate face. Mm-hmm. That is an actor, Sara Garcia, who always played the grandmother in all the movies of the Mexican golden era in the 50s. And in actually in one of the scenes of a movie where she, you know, she had many, many films. Actually, there's many cultural critics that said that she became the institution of motherhood and she became the grandmother of Mexico. Mm -hmm. So this is, to me, an example of how an ideology of Mexicanidad she was basically the Virgin of, of Guadalupe because she was desex, desexualized. She was self-abnegated. She was self-sacrificing. She only existed for her kids. She is the one who counted as victim. So here, to me, it clearly shows how it is ideologies of Mexicanidad and not evidence that have determined who is a victim. And a serial killer is worse than a narco satanico because a serial killer happens in the United States where it's an individualistic society. Mm. Mexico is a, a society of family values. So if we are like United States where they have the phenomenon of serial killer, then that means that we are really bad. Not because of all other violent cases I can cite, but it is because of what it is believed to be a serial killer someone who acts on an individualistic society, basically killing the Virgin of Guadalupe. Or another example is how you mentioned they found an altar of La Santísima Muerte, the Holy Dead, in her house. And this became again in the house of Juana Barraza. And this became again evidence of her criminality because the criminals are believed to be, you know, many of them the poor. This cult is banned by the by Catholicism, but it is interesting to know that the rise of believers in Holy Dead happened really when uh, late nineties when NAFTA kicked in Mexico and with when neoliberalism started in Mexico and there was a, a total crisis of faith hmm. and the belief in the Virgin of Guadalupe took a dent. You know, you could not be believing in someone that will take to to heaven only, you know, those that can pay the diezmo. You know that diezmo? Like when you give part of your salary to church? Tidings, is it in English? I'm not sure. So that tradition in, uh, in Catholicism that yeah. still holds in a way of the virgin that, you know, will condemn you if you do anything illegal. But when you have more than 80% of uh, the population living in extreme poverty, and many of them have to resource to illegalities, especially when they don't have any protection of the state anymore or health care, or, you know, it, it is exactly at this moment of neoliberalism that the rise of um, the cult of to Holy Dead, that then she comes as that as the evil twin sister, a writer said, because then she is fair. You know, she will take you no matter what, like you're going to die. And she will take you even if you're rich or poor or white. And she understands if you have to sell an iPhone, if you have to deal with to sell a bag of Gucci that is not really a bag of Gucci, or if Mm. you have to, you know, commit pity thieves, or if you have to deal drugs like marijuana, or there is a lot of um, a really different um, approach to, there's also no intermediaries. And the cult has grown a lot. And the researchers on this cult point out how is... It's a cult that is banned, but 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 that it forgives. You know, you can you can talk to Holy Dead, and she can forgive these if you are not an ideal Mexican. Mm-hmm. But for police, for criminologist Martin Barron, 
in his book, he puts a, f a photo of La Santa Muerte and he uses it as evidence that indeed Juan Barraza is the serial killer because she adores Mar uh, uh, La Santa Muerte and Martin Valverde, who's the, sa the saint of narcos. Actually, I cite these FBI pamphlets in which they talk about how these agents at the FBI caught criminals because they, in their car, had a, a stamp or a medal or whatever paraphernalia of Jesus Malverde. And then that clued them into, oh, they must have weed. And then they detained them. So it's an actual thing that the FBI does. If anyone is carrying um, Jesus Malverde, well, not anyone, I imagine Mexicans, <laughs> wearing um, Jesus Malverde, that is a tip off for an, a drug dealer. So again, a way of thinking becomes evidence, you know, like criminalizing um, at the door of La Santísima Muerte, that the evil sister of the total opposite of La Virgen de Guadalupe is a criminal. Juana Barraza having a statue of the holy dead made just corroborated and became evidence of her criminality. This is what I wanted to hopefully contribute and show because even if they would not agree with me, maybe one of the juries or expert witnesses or or criminologists who read this might th might say, oh that would be enough for me. Like, you know that they say, oh, okay, so. Yeah, well, it, like you said, it's um, on some level sometimes as if we're speaking different languages because of the fundamental beliefs that we may have, like ontologically what, what we can say actually exists or that we can find through uh, scientific study. But on another level, I think uh, questions of values and questions of um, intentionality, I think, are often often good in the sense that everyone is working towards in their own way, even perhaps flawed, the elimination or the, the curtailment of, of violent crime, for example, which makes me think, I want to ask as much as you feel comfortable talking about it. I mean, you've met with the murderer now, I mean, now that she's um, been found guilty, you've discussed how you sort of, I guess, push to the side the idea of guilt in order to look at discourses of what happened and uh, more general discourses of criminology. But uh, nevertheless, you met with her, you had to think about a lot of violence and a lot of really horrible things in your research. I mean, I know I just finished this editing of an encyclopedia on violence in America, and for probably, well, still, because it's still fresh in my mind, for, but for, for weeks, I just, it would be very easy for me to be like, America's a horrible place. Everyone's killing each other. They have been for, for hundreds of years, at least, and it's, it's horrible. And so you can get into a very um, dark place, I think, especially if you're not self-reflexive about it and, and thinking about it, which I know that you are. How did you manage to deal with this sort of emotional burden of even just thinking about serial killings in general, let alone uh, meeting with people who were involved in these things and, and researching, I'm sure, a lot of gruesome details as you went through it. How did you stop yourself from getting into a very dark place mentally? Or maybe if you did find yourself there, how did you deal with that? Well, now I'm going to tell you the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, when I, I was very scared of meeting with Juana Barraza, you know, nervous, Mm -hmm. And when I saw her and we were in the same room, I, she was wearing elect, electric blue eyeshadow, very similar to my mom. And so I kept on staring at her eyes and I was first shocked that they were not cold and harsh and she didn't have very harsh, intense look. Like she smiled even with her eyes. When we were talking, she talked. She mostly did all the talking for about two hours and I had very... I just wanted to listen and I was not allowed to have a recording or, or, or write anything down. So I was really trying to pay attention. But uh, but there was a power dynamic in which she had the power. There was no officials, no, no windows in the room we were meeting, and I was scared. And she noticed it and she asked me, and I didn't reply because I actually didn't know what I was scared of because then I was having these conflictive feelings inside me of, you know, coming from alternative criminology, knowing, actually having written a whole book stating how it was, I wanted her to be made responsible, but not being criminalized and trying not to talk about a species of person. Yet 
I was feeling something that I couldn't articulate, but was maybe fear or scared. And and she she told me, don't be scared. And I and I said, I'm not. And I smiled. And then she talked and she talked for a long time. And when she was talking, she was speaking very, you know, very soft voice. And I felt like, how can she also have this very soft voice? That is something that uh, that people tell me about my voice all the time. And then I thought, is this what people, that what I sound like? And then I was the whole time in my head thinking, am I now doing a transference? Like, have I take, taken my mm. empathy that really far? And... And I just had a bunch of emotions and feelings and, and thoughts inside me that I carried after that interview for for a long time with me. And, and and then I was like in a bad mood. But I I mean, even if I were not writing about this, people feel it. People that don't write about criminality still notice how how difficult it is lately for everyone. I don't know if more lately, but... It seems like it, yeah. It seems like, yes. You know, there there is in Mexico a tradition of Nota Roja, of a sort of news crime that doesn't have the same censorship that it does in the States. So you get photographs every day in every newsstand that are very gruesome. And maybe Mexicans have are more used to seeing them because there's no censorship. But in the States here, you witness a lot of uh, violence, like people getting stabbed in the subway much more often than you would in Mexico because Mexico is more class divided. So, you know, you, it's, it's, the class system is very, um, very present and that also translates into what you see. Mm-hmm. But I feel everyone feels it in a certain way. And my way of coping with it, like thinking about serial killer, killers is I do basic things like I tend to exercise, go to therapy, meditate, talk Mm -hmm. to other people and write a lot how I feel. Yeah, I I like to be present and be calm for what I am writing. I think is you can you can tell when you write and when you read something. And I really wanted to. To do a contribution, I really like what I was writing, it was as much for me to clear what I was like to clear my thoughts as, as to the hope the the people that hopefully will read it. Yeah. Has that changed for you after getting your thoughts out and after having the book out now? I, I would imagine getting great reception of the stuff I've seen, but um, regardless, I mean, your book is out and it's to some extent, probably emotionally out of you. Has it changed uh, your thinking or have your newer projects continued to, I, don't know, I guess, set the same tone? In other words, do you feel sort of a weight lifted after getting it out and into the world through your book? To be honest, no. No, not yet. <laughs> Maybe because it just came out in, in Athens and that's very recent. You know, I finished writing it about a year ago, but now it all has come again because I am promoting it. Mm-hmm. And the new project I'm working on are the photographs of uh, Nota Roja, of news crime that I was telling you about. Mm. But I do feel that after these, I want to write more about dance <laughs> <laughs> or art. I, I actually started writing, I had a column for teenagers on art and gender that I did at the same time as I was writing the book. So mm. I was forced once a week to go to a show, an art show, and then write about it for like from 15 to 25 years old. And that Hmm. was the hardest audience. And it was totally different, but it really emotionally helped me. I think that Mm -hmm. we all need that kind of self-care. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's interesting because I've heard from speaking to people now that writing, it can be a therapeutic form of uh, of thinking through and therefore, I guess, dealing with certain ideas that might otherwise just be always sort of percolating in your mind when you see images of crime, for example. Some people, uh, myself included, I think, go back and forth between dealing with sort of something cruel and violent in terms of the content think- we were thinking about and then doing something sort of fun like like dance or for me, like comic books. But yeah, I guess as you go forward, what have you learned from this experience in any way, whether that's writing or whether that's uh, emotional self-care, anything? What have you taken from this experience that you'll use in future work? 
I, I've learned so many things like f- about myself. First, I, I learned that I can write a book, which mm-hmm. already feels amazing because I didn't know I could write a book and that I, you know, I feel satisfied. And about myself, I learned a lot of things about my own Mexicanidad and my own machismo. You know, by the end of the book, I talk about the life of Juana Barraza, that she was sold by her mother. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know until I wrote this book that that was also what happened to the indigenous women who historically has been charged with betraying the nation to the Spanish. La Malitzin, she was also sold by her mother. That I didn't know. So making that association and thinking about bad mothers, not uh, culturally, but actually how would it feel to, you know, psychoanalytically or emotionally, how it must have felt to have those mothers. But then at the larger level, that's how the story of Mexico started with an indigenous woman being sold by her mother as a slave, who then became the mistress of the colonizer, betrayed the nation, or that's the official story, and then had the very first Mexican, or again, this is how the story has been written, mm-hmm. the first serial killer in Mexico, and the first, and the indigenous women that betray the nation, even though there was no nation, to the Spanish have a very similar life story. So what does that say about mothers that are not the Virgin of Guadalupe or abuelitas that are not the Virgin of Guadalupe? That might be something that I will be coming back to more and more. But that was, a, uh, you know, there is a way in which I, I don't know how to think about it or think it through, but you've seen the performances that the, the collective Las Tesis started in Chile, and they and they do this performance with um, with fo- like something folding her eyes, and then they did it in Chile, and, and they said um, a violador, un violador en tu camino, a, a rapist in your path, and it talks about. Have Have you seen it? No, I haven't seen it. Oh, I really recommend it because they did it, and they were like a hundred women. They've done it in Mexico, in New York, in. Turkey, in India, of course, Mexico, in Colombia, in many um, states inside Mexico, like in Spain, many women all over the world have now reproduced this, this anthem and this performance. And it feels so liberatory. And in the lyrics, it said that, you know, that the rapist is you, the police, the state, and is trying to give uh, justice to victims of feminicides. So they are taking after the work of uh, an anthropologist from Brazil. That her name is Rita Segato. And she has talked about them, how a rape is not individual, but because many men have um, a solidarity bond with other men. So it's, of course, about power, but it's also about this way of of showing to other men and how the state keeps on doing it and and the police. And Mm. so I don't know how to articulate it because it is, of course, about not phallic, but, you know, rape in this way is performed by cis men, Mm -hmm. you know? And so when you want in gender to think about gender, not from... um, Essentialist? Yes, like biological essentialism, you have to reconciliate mm-hmm. these two ideas. So I discover or I learned through this book how these bad mothers were macho and that how macho is a position that both cis women and cis men want to take to exercise power. So how it is to think of machismo and rape as a level of an individual but as a level of the state with these or you know with thinking of gender as not biologically essentialist Mm -hmm. i don't know this is the very first time i say it out loud sorry that it was so broken but i don't know how to articulate it but that's what i've been thinking yeah I, i appreciate that i think that highlights some of the power of your book here where 
even though it's about this one, it's it may seem to be about this one particular woman in this one particular case. It's really about a lot of different power dynamics in terms of gender and in terms of state and ideology and the sort of mythologies of of nationhood and the experiences that people have that can't be as tangibly assessed as things like brainwaves or something like that. And yet, this is how a woman can be seen as a monster through certain discourses or seen as sort of a victim of circumstances under others. You present so much to think about with this book that I'm I'm so happy that it was recommended to me because really, like I said, I wouldn't have known necessarily from the cover, and that's not to say that it's not a good cover or anything. It looks very cool. But I wouldn't have known from the cover how much depth and, uh, and sort of cultural studies this book really is. And uh, it's just been wonderful hearing more about it. I want to really thank you for taking the time to speak to me today, Suzanne. It's been wonderful. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much for listening to This Is Not A Pipe podcast. There are a number of really excellent interviews coming up this year. I look forward to sharing them with people. And I also look forward to hearing and receiving feedback, whether that's through Twitter, Facebook, email, or the website, which you can access at tinapp.org to see people's recommendations, to send coffees to the program as a way to help support this is not a pipe podcast as well as to see what's in the pipeline and about to be released in the future until next time thanks for listening i'm chris richardson cheers